Today's video is another compilation of some of the worst mountaineering tragedies we have covered on this channel. From the first accident in 2024, to a 40-year-old unsolved disappearance, to the 2023 killer mountain season, and finally, the most famous Linen Peak disaster. We cover it all. I appreciate everyone who watches my marathon videos, but if you want to see new stories as they get posted, just hit the subscribe button as I post once a week. And remember, viewer discretion is advised. The 2023 climbing season on Nanga Parbat was hectic as mountaineers from all over the world attempted to summit the ninth tallest mountain in the world. A few climbers would be successful, but their stories are overshadowed by the controversy and shortcuts made by commercial expeditions during their summit pushes. Experienced and beginner climbers all struggled to safely reach the summit in return, with many having to be hospitalized or helped off the mountain. However, one story highlights these mistakes more than all the others. This is the story of Pavel Kopak and the 2023 climbing season of Nanga Parbat. When attempting to climb an 8,000 meter peak, there are a few options for any individual. The solo choice is by far the most expensive, requiring you to coordinate all the preparations yourself, seek the proper government approvals, and outsource any help desired. This option is rarely taken, and if pursued, it is only done by the most experienced individuals. Another choice is to team up with other experienced mountaineers, where you rely on the skills of each other and share the costs. These type of expeditions are common when attempting to complete a specific goal. Think of 14 peaks on Netflix with Nims Perja. Lastly, and the most common way to climb an 8,000 meter peak is through commercial expeditions. Commercial expeditions will provide individuals with the team, supplies, and the proper documentation needed. These can have varying costs with a wide variety of assistance provided. The more money one is willing to pay will result in more assistance and luxuries provided. Almost all commercial expeditions are responsible for planning the climb as well as the route. The only expectation for individuals signing up is that they are sufficient mountaineers who fully understand the risk of attempting something as challenging as reaching the summit of an 8000er. But what happens when the mountaineers did everything right and the commercial expeditions took a shortcut, causing an increase in risk for all climbers? Who takes responsibility then? Or more importantly, what is being done to prevent this from happening again? Nanga Parbat stands as the ninth tallest peak in the world and is one of 14 8,000 meter mountains on our planet. It is the westernmost major peak in the Himalayas and is notorious for being an extremely difficult climb, so much so that it has earned the nickname Killer Mountain for its high number of fatalities. Statistically, one in five climbers who successfully summit will die. It stands as one of the ultimate challenges for any elite mountaineer. Take a look at Pavel Kopak's Facebook page, and within seconds it is clear that the man loved to be in the outdoors. His page is filled with photos of excursions into the forest, venturing into a cave, or climbing a mountain. Originally from Poland, he lived in the southern city of Kielce, being an avid mountaineer. Pavel was a part of the Sviatokreski Mountaineering Club, and had successfully summited Monoslu in 2019. After a failed attempt to climb Lhotse in 2021, the climber set his eyes on Nanga Parbat. There are many different expeditions on the Killer Mountain for the 2023 climbing season, but the most popular one was Seven Summits Trek. In previous years, the expeditions coordinated with each other to share campsites and supplies, and this year would be no different. About a month was spent between porters and climbers establishing the route in high camps. This year on Nanga Parbat, the expeditions would be following the popular Diamir West Face route. However, unlike previous seasons, commercial teams didn't try to set up a fourth camp, which typically lies around 7,400 meters. Instead, they launched their summit pushes from Camp 3 at 6,800 meters. Now, this might be okay for many climbers on Supplementary O2, but it is a long haul for those without extra gas, and there were a number of them. 
Paweł Kopak traveled to the Himalayas with two other Polish climbers. They would lean on each other for support, but ultimately each man would be climbing individually and at different times. They would not be guided by Sherpas, nor did the men plan to use supplemental oxygen. Pavel and the other Polish climbers would arrive in the Himalayas before June and begin their acclimation trips to become accustomed to the high altitude terrain. After weeks of hard preparations and adjustments, the men were anxiously waiting for their summit push, but they would not have to wait long because at the start of July, there would be a small window with good weather. The problem was, many expeditions planned to summit at this time, so there would be traffic on the mountain, but not enough to cause any major delays. The window would not last long, as a blizzard was predicted to hit the mountain on July 4th, so the men readied themselves and set out towards the summit at the end of May. They all climbed at their own pace and took several days to progress up the mountain, but they did so successfully with little problems. On July 1st, all three Polish climbers had made it to Camp 3 at 6,800 meters and were 1,300 meters away from their goal. Pavel woke up on the morning of July 2nd ready to start his day before the sun had risen. Men and women from various expeditions were already up, getting ready for their own climbs. After a quick bite to eat, Pavel tightened his snow boots and set out, determined to reach the top of Nanga Parbat. The daunting task did not deter him, nor his fellow Polish climbers who were already ahead of him. Pavel was slow to make progress up the peak, but it would not just be him. Almost all of the mountaineers were slow. Many expeditions were suffering due to Camp 4 not being established. Pavel kept moving up the mountain throughout the day as the sun slowly crept across the sky, and finally, at around 3 p.m., he would reach the summit. He was ecstatic that he had accomplished his goal. However, this feeling did not last long due to the weather worsening. Dark clouds began to fill the sky and a drop in temperature signaled bad news. The blizzard had come early. Pavel, already exhausted, knew that he still had a long way to go before safety. Luckily, he would not have to descend alone as one of the other Polish climbers had summited around the same time. They both began their climb together but neither were in good shape. In fact, many climbers that had reached the summit began experiencing issues on their descent. Further down the mountain, a Lithuanian expedition had set up a small Camp 4 at 7,350 meters as they were planning to push for the summit the next day, but that would never happen. Instead, this camp would serve as a medical tent for multiple climbers returning from the summit. As the blizzard moved in, chaos on the mountain ensued. The radio at the makeshift Camp 4 began spewing ominous messages as climbers still descending would periodically pass others needing help. The location and status of these mountaineers were given over the radio in case anybody could answer the call. A member from the Hungary expedition lost his glove and was experiencing extreme frostbite on his hand. An unknown climber was hallucinating, unable to continue, and required a guide. Pavel and the Polish climber with him were both massively struggling. Both men were disoriented, but worst of all, Pavel was suffering from altitude sickness and no longer even knew his name. By midnight, there were still many climbers on the peak, slowly making their way down in the harsh conditions. The small Camp 4 originally set up by the Lithuanian expedition was overrun with mountaineers seeking shelter from the blizzard and requiring first aid. At 1 a.m., a voice over the radio shouted that Pavel was near the small Camp 4, but desperately needed oxygen. It was the other Polish climber with him. Two men, Damilevicius and Velodimir, left their tent and climbed about 200 meters to the location of Pavel. He looked bad, really bad. The men tried to help Pavel to his feet, but his legs just didn't work. Instead, Damilevicius decided to return to Camp 4 to ask for help. On his way down, he ran into another confused climber, who was dragged into camp and taken to a nearby tent. Damilevicius quickly grabbed supplies and tried to enlist whatever help he could find, but sadly, nobody at Camp 4 was in good enough condition to be of assistance. Instead, he requested oxygen and help over the radio. Damilevicius returned back to Pavel and the other climber, hopeful that help would come. Pavel laid in Volodymyr's arms as the men tried to keep Pavel conscious by keeping conversation with him. They heated up some water and forced Pavel to drink. An hour passed, and then another, and their hopes of help coming began to diminish. Realizing that no help was on the way, they tried to move Pavel themselves, but were unable to descend very far, when all of a sudden, Pavel would stop breathing. He would die at 3.19am in the arms of his fellow mountaineers. 
Domula Vicious and Velodimir would continue to help climbers for the next five hours. Miraculously, they would all make the trip back to base camp safely together. Many were left frustrated and questioning the decision made by multiple expeditions. If a proper Camp 4 had been set up, the summit push would not have been so difficult, and in turn, the descent would have been much easier as well. But alas, that is not how the story goes. Instead, it is a reminder that expedition planning plays a crucial role in the success of one reaching the summit. And when you are on that peak, don't expect anybody to come and save you. On April 27th, Nikolai Jaeger set out on a climb on Lhotse Shar. Little did he know it would be his last journey. At over 6,500 meters, he was alone, without supplemental oxygen, and facing the daunting task of reaching the 8,400 meter summit. Jaeger had begun the ascent with a team of fellow climbers, but as the climb progressed, they became separated, each facing the mountain's challenges alone, with the most difficult part of the climb still ahead of them. The mountain presented a steep, exposed face that would test Jaeger to his limits. It was here, amidst the fierce winds and extreme cold, that he would make his final push for the summit. This was the last time Nikola Jaeger was seen, and the mystery of his disappearance began. This is his story. Lhotse Shar, standing at 8,382 meters, is a smaller peak compared to its neighbor, the towering 8,516 meter Lhotse. Although it's not considered a separate mountain, this eastern peak of Lhotse presents a formidable challenge as the routes to reach the subsidiary summit are extremely difficult climbs. The most common routes are the southeastern flank of the Shah itself, or the more direct route, Lhotse's towering south face. The first documented attempts of Lhotse Shar took place in 1964 and 1965. However, neither of these climbs were successful and had to be given up at 8,150 meters due to a difficult gap in the terrain. The first successful ascent of Lhotse Shar was achieved on May 12, 1970 by two members of an Austrian team, where they reached the summit via the Southeast Ridge using bottled oxygen. In 1984, a team from Czechoslovakia accomplished the first ascent without bottled oxygen, reaching the summit on May 20th and May 21st via a new route on the south face. Since then, out of 36 attempts on Lhotse Shar, only 9 teams have succeeded, taking 4 different routes. In total, 24 climbers have reached the summit, with 13 doing so without bottled oxygen. Even today, Lhotse Shar remains a rarely climbed peak, with the last ascent recorded in 2007. Tragically, 10 climbers have lost their lives while attempting its challenging slopes, indicating a relatively high fatality rate and further highlighting the difficult path. Nikola Jaeger was born on October 20th, 1946, in Bologna Bilianco, France. His mother was a renowned photographer, and it was under her creative influence that Nicola developed a deep appreciation for the beauty and grandeur of nature. From a young age, Nicola was drawn to the mountains, the towering peaks of the Mont Blanc Massif became his playground, where he honed his skills as an alpinist. He was not content with following the paths of others, instead, he sought to carve out his own routes, making over 100 solo ascents and achieving several first ascents that would cement his reputation as a pioneering mountaineer. His passion for climbing was matched only by his dedication to medicine. As a physician, Nicola understood the physical and psychological demands of high altitude climbing. This unique perspective allowed him to push the boundaries of what was considered possible in the realm of mountaineering. Jaeger's feats were not confined to the Alps. He ventured to the Andes where he continued to challenge himself with solo ascents, further demonstrating his remarkable ability to adapt and excel in some of the world's most unforgiving environments. In 1978, he became a part of a French expedition that went on a historic ascent of Mount Everest. At the summit, Jaeger, known for his unorthodox approaches, conducted an experiment that would become a talking point in mountaineering circles. He removed his oxygen mask and lit an unfiltered cigarette, 
this act was not just for bravado. Jaeger was keenly interested in the effects of oxygen deprivation at extreme altitudes. His observations were telling. While stationary, he found it manageable to be without an oxygen mask, but any movement became extremely difficult due to hypoxia. At altitudes of over 8,000 meters, the Earth's atmosphere is so thin that it creates inaccessible bubbles around the highest summits. Fields of rock and snow at the outer limits of the stratosphere are shielded from human intrusion by an invisible barrier known as hypoxia. Hypoxia literally means the absence of oxygen, acting like an insidious poison that suffocates not only the lungs and muscles, but also the brain. The following day, Jaeger and his fellow climber, Jean Afanasiev, made a record-breaking ski descent from 8,200 meters to 6,500 meters in just one hour, continuing their rapid descent to Camp 1. Jaeger's Everest experiment was a precursor to his more extreme achievements the following year. On Novato Hawaii, in 1979, he spent 60 days alone at 6,700 meters to study the body's response to high altitudes. During this time, he smoked 70 packs of cigarettes, a testament to his heavy smoking habit, and documented his psychological measurements and experiences in the book Carne de la Salitude. A year later, on April 16, 1980, Jaeger set out on his climb of Lhotse south face direct. This route is documented as one of the largest alpine walls in the world. As Lhotse towers over the entire Everest base camp, it is littered with rock bands and the entire ascent is made in an avalanche prone area. He managed to reach an altitude of 6,500 meters, but had to turn back because of the high risk of a snow slide. Disappointed, he returned to base camp after four days on April 20th. 20th. Undeterred by his initial setback, Jaeger planned his next attempt differently. This time, he aimed to ascend further to the right of the south face, which would lead him to Lhotse Shar. Jaeger shared his ambitious plan with those at base camp. He expressed his intention to undertake a massive traverse, which had been unheard of before. Starting from Lhotse Shar, he planned to continue to Lhotse Main, passing through the then unclimbed Lhotse Middle, and eventually descending via the Western Kum. Additionally, he contemplating attempting the solo ascent of Everest. This traverse represented an incredibly challenging and risky undertaking, with slim chances of success. However, Jaeger remained confident in his abilities and believed he could withstand the harsh conditions at high altitudes for an extended period. Jaeger would bring along enough food for 15 days and set out from Lhotse Shar's southeast ridge on April 25th. Over the next two days, he would climb higher and higher, as men watched from base camp through a telephoto lens. He was at an altitude of 8,200 meters on Lhotse Shar, when the mountain's unpredictable nature provided to be an insurmountable challenge. The weather had turned bad, and strong winds hit the mountain, ripping anything off its face not properly secured. As the thin air clung to his lungs, Jaeger vanished into the icy abyss, no longer visible from below. His last moments remain a haunting mystery leaving a void in the hearts of fellow climbers and adventurers. Jaeger had made it clear that if he didn't return within 15 days, it should be assumed he didn't make it back and there was no need for a search. Unfortunately, bad weather persisted for six days, and despite a helicopter search, there was just no sign of him. Following his family's wishes, the search was called off. For many, this marked the end of the story. And for 39 years, even Jaeger's family believed this was all they would ever know about his final climb. However, three years after Jaeger's fatal 1980 expedition, a discovery was made that went unnoticed by almost everyone. On October 21st, 1983, Canadian climber Roger Marshall went on his own Himalayan quest. As he pushed towards the summit of Lhotse Shar, he stumbled upon a solitary tent. According to some studies, the tent didn't belong to Jaeger, but was from a previous expedition, possibly in 1965 by the Japanese, or maybe from the first ascent team in 1970, or even the Korean team in 1971. Sadly, I don't think anyone will ever know for certain which party the tent belonged to. 
There are wide slopes between 7,143 and 8,019 meters, suggesting the tent was near the 8,019 meter mark. This implies Jaeger might have reached 8,200 meters before turning back to the tent around 8,000 meters, if the supplies were in fact his. During an investigation into the Tomo season case in 2013 to 2014, mountaineering researcher Rodolphe Popier discovered a note in the Himalayan database referring to the book Canadians on Everest, The Courageous Expedition of 1982. The book recounts the tale of the inaugural Canadian climb to the top of Everest. In the book, it is mentioned that climber Roger Marshall came across the body of Nikola Jaeger in 1983 on Lhotse Shar. Jaeger's body was found inside a tent located less than 500 meters below the summit. Sadly, Marshall passed away in 1987, preventing confirmation of this theory. But if you believe his words, it leads people to believe that the tent was in fact Jaeger's. The risk and challenges faced by Nikolai Jaeger serve as a sobering reminder of the dangers inherent in high altitude mountaineering. His memory will surely endure, motivating future adventurers to approach similar challenges with both caution and admiration. On March 29, 2024, an experienced climber stood on a cornice of Mount St. Helens in Washington State, attempting to video and take pictures of his ascent to post on social media. Having successfully conquered the peak nearly 30 times, he was no stranger to its treacherous slopes, but while standing on the crater's rim, he would feel every climber's worst nightmare, the snow under his boots moving. What would happen next is nearly unbelievable. This is his story. Before we jump into the video, I want to thank all my loyal viewers and subscribers. You mean the world to me. And for those new here, please consider dropping a sub, as the 2024 climbing season is just getting underway. Hopefully, we don't have very many of these videos to report, but nevertheless, your support is appreciated. Mount St. Helens is a towering volcano located in Skamania County, Washington, USA. It's part of the Pacific Northwest, a region known for its stunning landscapes and natural wonders. Geographically, Mount St. Helens is not far from major cities like Portland, Oregon, about 52 miles southwest, and Seattle, Washington, roughly 98 miles to the north. This volcano is nestled within the Cascade Range, a chain of mountains that forms part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, stretching from California to Canada. Mount St. Helens is one of several volcanoes in this range. Today, the mountain stands at 8,363 feet tall, making it a popular place for mountaineers and outdoorsmen. But the volcano has a dark history. Mount St. Helens, a Washington state volcano, has been dormant for over a century, but today it erupted with smoke and ash after a week of earthquakes which rattled the area. The volcano oozed lava and belched an explosion that was heard up to 45 miles away. The blast took place about 1 o'clock this afternoon. It was the first volcanic eruption in this country since... In the spring of 1980, Mount St. Helens began to show signs of unrest. On March 27th, volcanic explosions and pyroclastic flows marked the start of a turbulent period. Over the next two months, a series of earthquakes and steam-venting episodes rocked the mountain, signaling the injection of magma beneath its surface. This activity caused a large bulge to form on the north slope, and created a fracture system. Then on May 18, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., a magnitude 5.1 earthquake shook the mountain, triggering a massive landslide on its north face, the largest subaerial landslide ever recorded. An aerial observer saw the north side of the mountain looking all rippled and churning just before it started to slide northwards from the summit. As the avalanche came down, it split into three parts. The surrounding lakes would rise as the avalanche plowed out into the water, along with other areas being affected from the amount of debris and trees flooding the valleys below. The biggest part of the avalanche went westward down the north fork of the Toodle River Valley. It moved fast, covering about 15 miles in just 10 minutes. When it settled, it spread out over the valley floor, about 150 feet deep on average but in some spots, it piled up to more than 500 feet deep. The mess it left behind covers around 24 square miles. It's a mix of different stuff from the volcano, like big blocks, pebbles, sand, and even chunks of glacial ice. 
all jumbled together. When the north flank of the volcano suddenly gave way, it let out a huge burst of pressure from inside. It's like when you open a shaken soda bottle or poke a hole in something under lots of pressure like a boiler tank. This blast shot out to the north, smashing everything in its path. It covered 150 square miles, causing havoc in its wake. Trees were ripped off hills within 6 miles of the volcano, and pretty much all plants were flattened for up to 13 miles in a half circle north of the mountain. The blast left layers of rocks, bits of plants, and other stuff over the area, some piles more than 3 feet thick. By late afternoon on May 18th, the eruption started to calm down, and by early May 19th, it had completely stopped. During the nine hours when the volcano eruption was at its height, about 540 million tons of ash fell over an area of more than 22,000 square miles. For context, that is greater than the size of Croatia. But compared to all the stuff that slid off the volcano during the avalanche, it's only about 10% of that amount. The ecological impact was devastating, with thousands of animals killed and trees covering over 200 square miles blown down by the force of the eruption. In response, Governor Dixie Lee Ray declared a state of emergency. However, she controversially believed that people should use their judgment and stay away from the mountain, sparking debate over government intervention in disaster situations. The eruption of Mount St. Helens remains the deadliest and most economically destructive volcano event in U.S. history with approximately 57 deaths and $1.1 billion in property damage. Governor Ray's approach faced criticism, but she defended her actions, emphasizing the acceptance of risks in daily life. The disaster also prompted significant changes in disaster preparation and government response in the region. In September of 2004, the volcano returned to life after 18 years of silence. The slow-moving, dome-building eruption extruded a dump truck of lava into the crater per second and continued for three and a half years. Roscoe Rocky Shorey, a daring mountaineer, hailed from the scenic town of Washougal, Washington, nestled in the Pacific Northwest. He was originally from Hawaii, where his Filipino immigrant mother would teach him the value of perseverance. Rocky, along with his sister and parents, would move to Vancouver, Washington in 1988. Rocky's parents had spent their early lives in extreme poverty, before moving to Hawaii to give their children a better life. Since his youth, Shori possessed an unquenchable thirst for adventure, drawn to the rugged beauty of the Cascade Range. While he always had a fascination for the outdoors, he also had an active social media account where he consistently posted videos and pictures of his expeditions. Rocky lost his mother as a teen, and it shaped him. He felt as if he could never waste a second, especially when it came to exploring the outdoors. In 2023, one week, he spent time whitewater rafting on the Arkansas River and was in a helicopter touring the Swiss Alps the next. In October, he was scuba diving with manta rays in Hawaii. In November, he was rock climbing at Smith Rock Park. Finally, in December, he trekked through the Himalayas. His connection with Mount St. Helens ran deep, having summited the volcano an impressive 27 times. His last successful summit of the mountain was on March 14th, when he posted this photo and video of him snowboarding down the slope. Beyond St. Helens, Rocky went on perilous expeditions across the globe. As a seasoned guide, he had led others through daunting alpine challenges, fascinating them with tales of his epic adventures. Another frequent expedition was to Mount Hood, where he displayed his remarkable skills and resilience by conquering the formidable peak over 40 times. On March 29, 2024, Rocky Shorey would plan to once again complete a climb of Mount St. Helens, then snowboard down the steep slopes, documenting his entire expedition. What he didn't realize is this time, his climb would be different than any of the other 27 trips on the mountain. The day started like all the others. There really wasn't any excitement. The mountain is usually climbed in one day, and typically takes anywhere from 7 to 12 hours, depending on the route. Since Rocky had completed the climb so often, he didn't face anything that he wasn't expecting, and after a few hours, he stood near the summit. Rocky would remove his backpack and other gear, setting it beside him while he pulled out his camera and began taking pictures and a video about 20 feet from the edge of the crater. Without warning, an enormous cornice, a menacing overhang of snow, 
broke loose and plummeted into the crater below. Cornices range from small wind lips of snow to overhangs of hard snow larger than a school bus. They can break off the terrain suddenly and unexpectedly and can sometimes be triggered from a distance. Overhung cornices can pull back further than expected onto a flat ridge top and catch people by surprise. The force of the falling snow knocked Rocky off his feet, sending him tumbling down the mountainside. He dug his fingers into the edge of the cornice in a desperate attempt to stop his fall, but he couldn't hold on, leaving deep gouges in the snow as he slid off the edge and plummeted about 1,200 feet, landing in an avalanche, triggered by the piece of the cornice that had fallen from under him at the top. The mass of snow carried him deeper into the crater. As the snow settled around him, he had no doubt that he was lucky to be alive, but the 42-year-old was alone in the unforgiving wilderness inside the crater of Mount St. Helens. Rocky faced a desperate struggle for survival. Clad only in snowboard boots, synthetic pants, and a lightweight shirt, he fought against the elements. With sheer determination, he clawed his way out of the snow, determined to defy the odds. His goal was to climb the icy, near-vertical interior wall of the crater and reach the safety of the rim above. Rocky would zigzag his way up the nearly vertical face, and he almost nearly reached the top. Twenty feet away from the top of the crater, a snow overhang prevented Rocky from climbing any further. Eventually, he would give up his current plan, descending back down the nearly vertical wall before walking east and trying a similar method on a different part of the wall. He would be digging his hands into the snow as he climbed, but it was no use. His snowboard boots offered little traction and he could not successfully climb. On yet another attempt to climb over the rim, Rocky would slip and fall again. This time, he would not get up. Rescuers would eventually see three areas where his body had hit the snow during his second fall. The first inkling that something could be wrong came late that evening when Rocky failed to respond to messages from his closest and oldest friends. His absence was noticed by fellow climbers, who discovered personal items including a backpack and digital recording devices near the crater's rim at 7am the following day. It became evident that a snow cornice had broken off, leading to Rocky's tragic fall. The climbers would peer into the crater where they would see a body lying motionless about 1,200 feet below, along with evidence of a struggle to climb the wall inside. They would then descend the peak to make a call to rescue services. But on the trip down, they came across a climber who instantly recognized Rocky's gear, as she was a close friend of his. A search and rescue team was swiftly airlifted into the crater, where the pilot took the helicopter back and forth, close to the edge of the approximately one mile wide crater, until the crew spotted what looked like a body in the snow. They touched down in the dome inside the crater. Because of the volcanic activity in the crater, people aren't allowed to go in except for special circumstances, such as during professional rescues. The environment there is constantly changing. Steam vents open up unexpectedly, and the ground shifts daily. Eventually, after securing Rocky's body, he would be airlifted out of the crater. One of the rescuers would state he gave it everything he could to survive. We were all thinking, like, who is this guy? Who is this person? He almost made it to the top. Rocky's death would shock the mountaineering community, and tributes have been pouring out on his Facebook page, with friends posting pictures of themselves eating his favorite treat, a Dairy Queen blizzard. Some friends have struggled to grasp that a man as experienced as Rocky died on Mount St. Helens, generally considered a relatively safe and easy climb compared to most other peaks in the Pacific Northwest. I don't think there is a better way to end Rocky's story than a quote from his close friend. He lived life with a zest and vibrancy that most of us will never understand, and in his 42 years of short life, he definitely lived well over a hundred years worth of life. In the summer of 1974, there was a big camp in the southern part of the Soviet Union. More than 170 brave hikers gathered, all set to climb Lenin Peak. Among them were eight fearless Russian women. They had a bold dream to be the first all-female team to conquer the peak, but things took an unexpected turn. As they were coming back down, a huge storm trapped them on top of the mountain, and they faced a terrible tragedy. This 
is their story. Linen Peak, the towering 7,134 meter giant of the Transalay Range in Central Asia, on the border of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, stood as a challenge and a dream for many climbers. Among them was Elvera Shataeva, a renowned Russian mountaineer who made her mark in the climbing world and was among the most famous athletes in the USSR. She had been granted the role Master of Sport, a top credential in the Soviet Union, and one that is rarely given to women. Compared to other high-altitude mountains, Linden Peak is certainly not the biggest, nor is it considered a technical challenge making it a popular choice to climb. In fact, it has one of the highest ascent rates of all 7,000 meter peaks globally, with each year hundreds of climbers reaching the summit. But despite its reputation as one of the less technically challenging climbs, Lennon Peak presents formidable obstacles, unpredictable weather, freezing temperatures, and the constant threat of avalanches, all exacerbated by the extreme altitude which had thwarted many attempts in the past. Shataiva, with her expertise and fame as an athlete, despite the wishes of her peers, decided to lead an all-female expedition of eight climbers to conquer this formidable peak. In the 1970s, women were rarely seen as equals to men, and so this was an opportunity for Shataiva to prove just that. Perhaps her familiarity with Linden Peak played a role in her decision. She had scaled its heights before, albeit as part of a mixed group, which included her husband, Vladimir Shataiva. In June 1974, a bustling international mountaineering camp sprawled across the southern Soviet Union, nestled on the border of modern-day Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan in the Pamirs, home to some of the world's loftiest peaks. This was the first major American expedition allowed in the Soviet Union, as the event was held to showcase the developing relationship between the USSR and the West. Among the 170 climbers hailing from various nations, 19 Americans stood out, including two women representing the 1974 American expedition. Molly Higgins, a 24-year-old, recalls meeting Shataiva briefly, finding her aspiring. Arlene Blom, part of the Swiss team, also remembers conversing briefly with Shataiva, who shared her group's goal of becoming the first all-female team to conquer Linden Peak. While bonding over their shared ambition, Arlene voiced concerns about the equipment Shataiva's team had, noting their dated tents with button closures and old-fashioned boots. With the unpredictable weather on Linden Peak in mind, Arlene questioned if their gear was adequate. According to other climbers on the mountain, the Russian team departed base camp for Camp 1 on July 30th, then proceeded towards the summit via the Lipkin route the following day. The ascent progressed smoothly until August 3rd when Shataiva called for a rest day due to cloudy weather and whiteout conditions reported between Camp 2 and 3. A whiteout occurs in snowy areas when objects don't cast shadows, reducing or blocking visual references like the horizon or terrain features. On August 4th, reports indicated a major storm was on the horizon, advising all mountain climbers to descend. Shataiva's team, apparently 400 feet below the summit, was observed walking in a line upwards. The next day, on August 5th, the Russian team radioed from the summit, reaching the top. By 5 p.m. that same day, they radioed to base camp from about 400 meters below the summit. Visibility had been deteriorating, prompting them to set up tents to wait for the storm to pass. Following this, there are slight discrepancies in the accounts according to Shataiva's husband, Vladimir. Base camp advised them with two options, either wait out the night or descend immediately if feasible. Another version, as described by Robert Craig in Storm and Sorrow, states that base camp instructed them to wait until morning and then descend via the same Lipkin route they had ascended. The team opted to wait out the night. The morning of August 6, brought five inches of snow. Shataiva radioed about worsening winds. They attempted to descend but were only able to progress a few hundred feet before encountering hurricane force winds in the early hours in the morning, which destroyed their tents and carried away any untied gear. Shataiva's team communicated again, detailing their struggles with continuous whiteout conditions and escalating winds. They also noted the illness of one woman and the unwell condition of another. The team leader instructed them to descend in search of snow suitable for digging shelter caves. According to Robert Craig, it was implied that if the sick women couldn't move, an adequate shelter couldn't be achieved. Leaving her behind might be necessary for the group's survival. During the descent, one team member Irina tragically perished while holding a safety rope for others. Attempts to dig caves in the hard snow proved futile 
Instead, they managed to erect two tents on a ridge just a few hundred feet below the summit. The health of the alien climbers deteriorated further, prompting the instruction for those still mobile to continue descending. Shataiva agreed with this plan. The subsequent timeline is unclear due to varying accounts. However, either on that day or the following one, two more ill climbers from the Russian expedition passed away. The five women left sought shelter from the fierce winds in one tent, lacking poles and with only three sleeping bags, they huddled together for the night. On the morning of August 7th, two Japanese climbers attempted a rescue mission but were thwarted by strong winds forcing them to retreat. Many climbers tried to help, but they were too far down the mountain to do much. Shataiva reported that some members of the group are deteriorating and getting sick. Despite being advised to, the women refused to leave anyone behind. Their last messages showed that they were sad, cold, and that they couldn't go on anymore. 10 AM, Shataiva. It is very sad here where it was once so beautiful. At noon, one more had died, two were dying. They are all gone now. That last asked, when will we see the flowers again? Two others earlier asked about their children. Now it is no use. At 3.30 PM, we are sorry. We have failed you. We tried so hard. Now we are so cold. Base camp in despair promise to rescue is underway. At 4 PM, the transmission was unclear, but another woman seemed to have died. Three remained. Winds up high were estimated at 80 to 100 miles per hour. The summit temperatures at minus 30 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. At 6.30 PM, another has died. We cannot go through another night. I do not have the strength to hold down the transmitter button. And finally at 8.30 PM, now we are two and now we will all die. We are very sorry. We tried, but we could not. Please forgive us. We love you. Goodbye. The next day, the American team went up to the mountain and found Shataiva's body along with their campsite and others. They used a radio from a Japanese team to tell base camp what they saw. A week later, Shataiva's husband and some others went up to bring back the bodies. The tragedy has multiple causes. One factor that is highlighted is inadequate equipment. The team also faced immense pressure, being the first all-female group and under scrutiny from numerous other teams. Many doubted the women's ability, driving Shataiva to prove them wrong and potentially causing a reckless determination. Moreover, it was evident that Shataiva also felt a profound responsibility for her team, echoed by fellow climbers. Their loyalty to one another led them to refuse leaving anyone behind. Speculation arose, including some from Shataiva's husband, suggesting she may have intentionally prolonged the climb, such as by calling a rest day on August 3rd to distance themselves from male support teams and assert their independence. Hindsight reveals that by passing this rest day might have positioned them lower on the mountain when the storm struck. Despite this, the concept of an all-female ascent is not novel. Women have a rich history in mountaineering. Women's contributions to mountaineering stretch back centuries with figures like Mary Perrette and Harriette D'Angville making significant summits. Despite initial skepticism and societal barriers, women have increasingly made their mark in mountaineering, showcasing their competence and resilience. In 2023, high up in the Himalayas, Louis Stitzinger set out on a daring journey to conquer Kanchenjunga, one of the tallest mountains on earth. He'd climbed many mountains before, but this one was different. It was his biggest challenge yet. As Luis made his way up the icy slopes, the air grew thinner and the wind howled fiercely around him. Yet his determination never wavered. He had a fire burning inside him, driving him forward, step by step. But just when it seemed like he was on top of the world, tragedy struck, and there was nobody there to hear his screams. This is his story. High in the eastern Himalayas, at a staggering altitude of 8,583 meters, stands Kanchenjunga the third highest mountain in the world. Its steep slopes and treacherous weather make it a formidable challenge for any climber daring to conquer its heights. Named the Five Treasuries of the Great Snow, due to its five majestic adjacent peaks nestled within the Himalayan range on the border of India and Nepal, with only the infamous Mount Everest and K2 surpassing it. Despite its beauty, Kanchenjunga is unforgiving. It holds a grim reputation with a 22% fatality rate 
claiming the lives of many who dare to scale its peaks. The first deaths on the mountain occurred back in 1905, as Sherpas and a Swiss mountaineer lost their lives to an avalanche, yet the allure of Kanchenjunga continued to beckon adventurers, leading to more casualties over the years, as men tried to become the first to summit. But even after their triumphant feat, Kanchenjunga remained a deadly challenge, claiming the lives of over 40 brave souls. Among the fallen were renowned climbers like Andrzej Czok of Poland in 1986, Wanda Ruchkiewicz, also from Poland in 1992, and Benoit Chamonix of France in 1995. These names, etched in the panels of mountaineering history, serve as a solemn reminder of the mountain's deadly embrace. Despite the risks, adventurers continue to test their mettle against Kanchenjunga, each ascent fraught with peril and the possibility of becoming another tragic tale on its slopes. Louis Steitzinger was born on December 16, 1968, in Fussen, Germany, and was destined for the heights of adventure. His father, Volkmar Bershi Stitzinger, himself a seasoned mountain guide, instilled in him a love for the mountains from an early age. Growing up in Ostalgue alongside his two younger siblings, Luis's passion for mountaineering only grew stronger over the years. He pursued his academic journey at the Faculty of Sports Science, which was a part of the Technical University of Munich, where he excelled and was honored with the prestigious Dr. Gertrude Kromholtz Prize. Not content with just one field of study, Luis also delved into English at LMU Munich while undergoing rigorous training to become a certified mountain and ski guide. From 1998 to 2003, Luis dedicated himself professionally to the Munich section of the German Alpine Club, serving as head of the mountaineering department overseeing the library and managing equipment rentals. His expertise and dedication earned him recognition and respect within the mountaineering community and kick-started his journey. The following years from 2004 to 2012, Luis took on new challenges as he led expeditions and extreme mountaineering ventures for the DAV Summit Club program. During his illustrious 30-year career, Luis achieved remarkable feats in the world of mountaineering, with an impressive 10 8,000 meter peaks conquered, some even summited multiple times, and seven daring ski descents under his belt, his adventurous spirit knew no bounds. Alongside his wife, Alex von Mel, an accomplished mountaineer, he scaled six of these majestic peaks, forging unforgettable memories in the thin air of the highest summits. Not one to shy away from pioneering endeavors, in 2006, Luis etched his name in mountaineering history by executing the first ski descent of Gasherbrum II, a towering peak standing at 8,034 meters. Accompanied by Sebastian Hogg and Benedict Baum, he navigated the treacherous slopes with skill and determination, leaving an incredible mark on the mountain and the community. Two years later, in 2008, Luis went on another groundbreaking adventure as he tackled the formidable domered face of Nanga Parbat. Scaling the peak multiple times that season, he reached new heights of bravery by clipping into his skis at a staggering altitude of 7,850 meters, just 300 feet shy of the mountain's summit. With each daring descent, Luis pushed the boundaries of what was thought possible in the realm of high altitude skiing, solidifying his legacy as a true pioneer of the mountains. In 2014, after conquering the heights of Broad Peak towering at 8,051 meters, alongside his wife, he set his sights on another formidable challenge, K2. Scaling past the daunting 8,000 meter mark, their journey was abruptly halted by the merciless grip of bad weather. Undeterred, he found himself on a daring descent, skiing from Camp 4 down to the very base of the majestic mountain. This trail, known as the Kukuczka Piotrowski Route, or the Polish Route, witnessed the first ever ski descent, marking a historic feat. It remained the longest ski descent on K2 until 2018. But little did he know that his journey to Kanchenjunga would mark the end of his extraordinary mountaineering tale, leaving behind a legacy etched in the panels of adventure. In May 2023, Luis had a big dream, to climb Kanchenjunga, the third tallest mountain in the world, all by himself. Being the experienced climber he was, he did not plan to use any extra oxygen or have a Sherpa to help him. To make matters more difficult, he also planned to ski down from the top of the mountain. Luis was very determined. 
and after weeks of preparation, acclimation trips, and training, he climbed up the steep icy slopes of Kanchenjunga. Facing many challenges along the way, the climb was difficult and tiring, but nothing would stop him. Over the span of multiple days, he cleared rock, snow, and ice until, finally, on May 25th at 5 p.m., his efforts were rewarded as Luis reached the very top of the mountain. The moment was filled with pride and joy, but instead of celebrating for too long, he knew his journey was only halfway over. Luis had decided to leave his skis a bit lower down on the mountain in preparation for his descent. This allowed him to save energy when reaching the summit and proved to be the correct decision. He carefully made his way down to their location and then stopped to rest to put on the skis. Skillfully descending through the snow and ice, Luis was a master on the white powder. Even though the sun was beginning to set, he kept going, showing his bravery and skill, or perhaps overconfidence. As the evening wore on and darkness cloaked the mountain in its embrace, Luis found himself still lingering near the summit of Kenchenjunga. Time passed as the hours stretched on, concern beginning to grow, and by 7 p.m. there was still no sign of his descent. But as the night deepened, worry turned to fear. With each passing minute, the silence grew more ominous. Despite the desperate efforts of rescue teams, the treacherous weather and impassable conditions thwarted any immediate aid. For two long days, the mountain remained shrouded in mist and uncertainty, with no relief in sight and no word from Luis. It wasn't until May 30th that a Sherpa team, undeterred by the challenges that nature had thrown its way, finally stumbled upon Luis's lifeless body at an altitude of 8,400 feet. His faithful crampon still adorned to his boots, a reminder of the journey that had led him to this fateful place. An autopsy later revealed the grim truth. Luis had succumbed to the merciless grip of high altitude cerebral and pulmonary edema, conditions brought on by the unforgiving altitude. His valiant spirit had been silenced. His final moments shrouded in the icy embrace of sleep on the night of May 25th or in the early hours of May 26th. Luis's untimely passing sent shockwaves through the mountaineering community, leaving behind a void that can never be filled. His friend and fellow guide, Dave Watson, took to Instagram to express the depth of his loss, highlighting not only Luis's remarkable achievements, but also his warmth, kindness, and boundless compassion. In the eyes of those who knew him best, Luis was more than just a skilled mountaineer. He was a beacon of positivity, radiating humility and grace in every step he took. As the world mourned the loss of a true pioneer, Luis's wife Alex found solace in the mountains they had both cherished. In the wake of her husband's passing, she resolved to honor his memory by continuing their shared passion for adventure and exploration, finding comfort in the familiar embrace of the wilderness they both loved so dearly. For Alex, the mountains were not just a place of solace, but a testament to the enduring bond they had shared, a bond that transcended even the barriers of death. And so with unwavering determination and a heart heavy with loss, she vowed to carry on their legacy, keeping alive the spirit of adventure and camaraderie that defined their lives together.